a giant widescreen motion picture that plays continuously each and every day. That any time you lift up your eyes, you see God's glory. Any time you see, uh, you open up your eyes, you behold the majesty of our God. I love taking sunrise pictures. And what's so amazing about the sunrise is that, that each sunrise may be similar within themselves, but nevertheless, each sunrise is unique. No sunrise, no two sunrises exactly the same. But we think about how the sky is so glorious, but how much more glorious is the creator of the sunrise. So here is what we're going to notice here in Psalm 19 is that the more we discover in the heavens, and we're learning this through technology and through science, the more we discover in the heavens, the more clearly we see God's power and His majesty. For instance, the magnetosphere is a magnetic, magnetic field surrounding the earth, reaching some 36,000 miles into space. And what it does is that it, it deflects most of the damaging particles that are generated by the sun. It, 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 da- it deflects most of the damaging particles of the particles of the solar wind around our planet. And so without this magnetosphere, our planet would not survive. But do you see that how God is an amazing electrical engineer? He is the one who designed this magnetosphere to make the skies not only beautiful, but to protect us at the same time. On February the 27th, 2013, a a team of astronomers published data on a supermassive black hole at the center of galaxy NGC 1365, or also known as the Great Barred Spiral Galaxy, which is only, only 56 million light years away. Uh, Astronomical how far it is away from our galaxy. Based on data from two X-ray telescopes, they calculated that the black hole was some 3 million kilometers across and its outer edges were, were spinning near the speed of light. And the pull of this particular black hole with this size is so powerful, it can disrupt an entire galaxy. Oh, my dear friends, how much more powerful is the God who created it? We should be impressed when we see the power and majesty of God in the universe that He has made. The heavens declare, they reveal God's glory. The word glory has the sense of being weighty or important. Glory is that asset which makes people or individuals impressive. Oh, beloved, listen, God has revealed how important He is. He has revealed how majestic He is through His glory, through the glory of creation. We notice, we see in verse 2, His glory is an universal witness. His creation is a universal witness. We understand that every human being sees this display of God's glory. The skies above are a constant and a consistent witness of God's glory. Psalm 19 and verse 2 tells us, Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. Literally every day, God gushes out His speech like an open fire hydrant gushes out water. Where one day leaves off, the next day picks up. And where the days end, then the night takes over. And so this verse is saying that day and night, 
This witness uh, to God's glory has been constant since the beginning of time. And so we not only see the universal witness of creation, but we also see this witness is also comprehensive, spanning the entire globe. We notice this in verse 3. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Which voice? The voice of creation. Their line has gone out throughout all the earth. And so we learn here that language and culture is not a barrier. Distance is not a barrier either. The voice of the heavens reach the farthest corners of the earth. Uh, For instance, a woman in New Guinea looks up and she can see the constellation Southern Cross. A man in Finland, Finland can look up and see the Big Dipper. Men and women in every age and every place have seen God's glory in the heavens. I love how David gives us a great illustration in Psalm 19 and verse 4. He says, In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. And rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from the one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end. And there is nothing hidden under or from its heat. Is there anyone who does not see the light of the sun? My dear friend, the scripture tells us here that it shines on every corner of the globe with such power that we cannot look at it very long without it burning our eyes. Did you know that the sun, or rather the earth, receives some 120,000 terawatts of energy from the sun each and every day? You say, Brother Wade, how much is that? Well, a a scientific writer, Oliver Morton, said this, 120,000 terawatts of energy is like 10,000 times the amount that flows through the industrial civilization. That is all the world's nuclear reactors, turbines, cars, furnaces, boilers, generators, and so on, all put together. 10,000 times greater than all those things combined. And if you still cannot fathom how much 120,000 terawatts are, He gave us this. He said, picture Niagara Falls flowing at full force. Now multiply the height of the falls by 20, and you would have a kilometer of falling water. Now multiply the flow by 10, and instead of having 30 tons of water falling over each meter of the falls every second, now you picture 300 tons of water per meter every second. Finally, widen the falls. Stretch them until they span a continent with trillions of tons of water falling over them every second. And he says, don't stop there. Widen them until they stretch all across around the equator. A kilometer high wall of water thundering down constantly, cutting the world in half. That is what 120,000 terawatts looks like. That is what the sun constantly pours out on our planet every single day, and God created it. As I told you a couple of weeks ago, I want to repeat this, that even though the sun is 92 million miles away, it will still burn your eyes if you look at it. And do you think that you're just going to somehow just casually stroll into the presence of the Son's Creator? No. Oh, my dear friend, let me tell you something. If you are a believer, God has surrounded you with a hymn book. That wherever you go, wherever you are, day or night, You can look up and you can see His majesty. You can see His power and you can praise Him for what He has done. And if you are not a believer, 
You are responsible for what the skies have been telling you ever since you have been born. You ought to worship the God of creation. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. Romans 1 20 says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen by the things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead, that is his divine nature, so that they are without excuse. Now you may say to yourself, well, I don't hear creation telling me about God. You say, but wait, I don't hear God speaking to me through creation. But think about it this way. If you shout at a person who's only about five feet away, and this person to whom you are shouting does not respond to you, you can make one of two conclusions. Either this person that you're shouting to is deaf, or this person you're shouting to is ignoring you. Now listen, if you don't see God's glory in the universe that He has made, you need the courage and honesty to ask yourself, could it be that I am deaf? Or could it be that I am ignoring God? Am I turning my back on Him? Why? Because the heavens declare. They reveal the very glory of God. And so we see, beloved, that God speaks through the world that He has created. God speaking, are you listening? And then notice, secondly, we see this next section is that God speaks through, through the word He inspired. God speaks through the word He inspired. And in this, we see the clarity of the Scriptures. Now, we just noticed and saw that the sky eloquently declares God's glory, but we cannot truly know God as He is to be known without the clarity of the Scriptures. We can see the power of God. We can see the majesty of God by looking at this, at this universe that He created, but we can only know Him personally through His written Word. Maybe some of you here have visited the Gilcrease Museum in Tulsa, Oklahoma. If you have, you would have noticed some spectacular sculptures that a man by the name of Fed, Frederick Remington has created. As a sculptor, he catches a horse floating in mid-gallop with its mane whipping in the wind, and you can feel the weariness of what he called his mountain man. All of this is enough. If you behold his bronze sculpture, all of this is enough to convince you that Remington was a true master sculptor. But it does not tell you anything about Remington himself as a man. What kind of person he was. Where he was born. What his middle name is. Oh, listen, my dear friends, in the same way we can see the glory of God in this universe, we can behold His power, we can behold His majesty and His wisdom in creation, but we cannot know Him personally and be saved without His Word. What is interesting here is that God's name is mentioned only once in the first half of the psalm. And in here, David uses the general name of God, El, in verse 1. But in the second half of this particular psalm, David uses God's name, Yahweh, some six times in verses 7 through 9. And then a seventh time in verse 14. God's name, Yahweh, is connected, oftentimes connected with His covenant, with His redeeming His people. And we know that God revealed himself to Moses as, Yah as Yahweh at the burning bush when he came to save Israel from the Egyptians. 
But notice by shifting to the name Yahweh, David is saying that while the heavens teach us that there is a glorious creator, the scripture introduces us to God as redeemer. And so we see the clarity of scripture. But then notice also the character of the scriptures. And that is in verses 7 through 9, describe the perfections of God's word and its effect on God's people. First of all, in verse 7, it says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The word law there in the Hebrew is the word Torah. And sometimes this refers specifically to the law of Moses, but here it refers to all of Scripture. And what it's saying is this, is that God's word is perfect. It is complete. It is blameless. It is without blemish. There is nothing missing from God's word. It is completely sufficient. There's not the slightest error in God's word. It is true in every detail. So God's perfect word, we notice also in verse 7, brings life to the human heart. So it says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Converting the soul. What does this mean? The scriptures convert us. Creation does not convert us. God's word converts us. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23 tells us that it is the word of God. We are born again through the word of God. God uses his word to give us life. When we were dead in our sins, He restores us and returns us to our Creator. But also this phrase, converting the soul or reviving the soul, is also used as food that restores strength and vitality. You see, there is, this, there is the sense here that the law of the Lord is our spiritual food. And we know that this was true for Jesus, right? When he was tempted, when Satan tempted him, he quoted the Scriptures. And in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And so we learn that the Scriptures were the bread and meat for Christ. And if they were the bread and meat for Christ, then we must know that the Scriptures are the bread and meat for those of us who are followers of Christ. The question this morning is this, are you feasting upon God's Word? Are you being revived daily and strengthened daily by a steady diet of God's holy Word? We go on and we find that God's Word also teaches us that the testimony of the Lord is sure. Making wise... The simple. Now the word simple here does not mean a fool, but someone who is uninstructed. The Bible makes us wise and teaches us how to live. We also see in verse 8 that the statutes of the Lord or the precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Now notice the progression here. How that God makes us alive. How? Through his word. He makes us wise unto salvation. And then the scripture teaches us here that he makes us glad. And then that, and then that joy is added discernment. Notice in verse 8, it says, The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Oh, listen, without God's word, we are in the dark. We stumble through life walking into walls and falling into one ditch after another. But with the light of Scripture, we see ourselves as sinners, and we can see the Lord who He is in all His holiness. The psalmist says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And then in verse 9, David shifts to focus on the relationship between God and His people. 
He says the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The word clean often has the sense of being ritually pure. The fear of the Lord purifies God's people. This lasting blessing endures forever, the scripture tells us here, qualifying us to be in God's presence for all eternity. Oh, listen, those who are made alive and made wise by God's word do learn to fear the Lord. Listen, do you know what our instinct is toward God? Our instinct is to somehow try to tame God. Our instinct is is, is to somehow make God manageable. But the Bible teaches us that God is genuinely a frightening God. For instance, when Isaiah saw the Lord seated on the throne, when the train of his robe filling the temple, Isaiah cried out, Woe is me, for I am undone, I am lost. When the apostle John saw the risen Christ in his glory, hey listen, his knees buckled and he fell at Jesus' feet as a dead man. Oh listen, the, the, the great prophets... The great apostles were terrified when they came face to face with the living God. God is truly fearsome. We need to fear Him. But notice also, not only is He fearful, but listen, God is good. God is good. If you know the God of the Bible, you love Him and you serve Him with deep respect and reverence for who He is. You cannot play games with the God of Scripture. You cannot play games with the God of this universe. His glory is overwhelming. He is truly awesome. Notice also we see the value of God's Word. The value of God's Word. We see this in verse number 10. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Oh, listen, God's Word is the greatest treasure for those who love Him. We love the Bible more than we love money, more than we love fine gold. God's Word is our greatest pleasure. Sweet honey represents the pleasure of the senses the finest tasting food, the best smelling perfume, the most fashionable clothes. He's saying that the Bible is better than those things. Let me ask you this morning, do you feel that way? Do you love the Bible and treasure the Scriptures? Listen, if you know God, His Word will be a treasure and your delight. Notice, thirdly, not only does we see here that God speaks through the world that He created and that God speaks through the Word that He inspired, but notice, thirdly, we see the obedience of the servant. The final four verses focus our attention on the obedience of God's servant. He has seen the glory of God in the sky He treasures the word of God and obeys it. We notice this in verse 11. Moreover by them your servant is warned. And in keeping them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from the secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of great sin. Transgression. Here David appeals to God for strength to obey. And he asks to be kept blameless. Here David as a prophet, he's speaking again for Christ. It's a picture of Jesus Christ. Jesus was fully God. Jesus also was fully man. He was a human being like you and me. 
As a man, he prayed to the Father for strength not to sin during his earthly life. And the word blameless there in verse 13 is the same word that describes God's word in verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect. It is blameless. In other words, the, uh, the servant here in Psalm 19 has the same blameless, complete, perfect, uh, perfect character as God, as God's word itself. Jesus is, in fact, the word of God incarnate. I love what Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3 tells us that Jesus was the brightness of the glory of God and the express image of his nature. After speaking through the law and the prophets, God spoke his final word through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Psalm 19 anticipates the stunning reality of the, serp, uh, of the servant as it shares the same blameless character as the word of God. But then notice verse 14. Psalm 19 ends with the servant's closing prayer. Verse 14 says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Since Jesus was acceptable in God's sight, we can be saved. Since he was innocent, he could die for sinners like you and me. And God vindicated Jesus and declared that he was innocent. How? By raising him from the dead. We need to turn to him and be forgiven. We need to follow him today. And so the sky and the scriptures, they teach God's servants to obey him. The skies and the scriptures point us primarily to Christ, the one who truly obeyed God. I ask you this morning, have you bowed your knee to Jesus' lordship? Have you bowed your knee to, to Jesus' lordship? Do you, have you ever come to a point in time in your life where you realize who you are? That you are a sinner. That you have broken the laws of God. And have you seen God in the scriptures as he is holy, pure, righteous? Do you understand that Jesus Christ is the true blameless one? One that lived this life, lived his life on this earth, never once sinned. Not in thought, word, or deed. He lived the life that you could not live. Now, have you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? So this, we see here that the scriptures, they point us to Jesus. The skies really, really declare the glory of who Jesus is. Let's pray together. Our Father, I pray, God, that you would speak, Lord, through your word. This morning, Father, I pray for the one that is here that has never been saved. Oh, Lord, remind them of the responsibility that they're going to have. That each and every day that you have given them life, and the ability to see and to sense, Lord, that they have seen your glory in creation. Lord, they're going to be responsible for what they have seen. They're going to be without excuse for what they have beheld with their own eyes. And Lord, even so much more after this message, they're going to be held even more responsible for what they've heard. As they have heard from your word. They've heard you speak to them, not only through creation, but through Scripture. And, oh God, I pray that the Holy Spirit would draw them to your Son, Jesus, today and be forever saved. That they would stop trying to earn their way to salvation. But, Lord, that they would see clearly today that there's only one way to be saved, and that is through Jesus Christ, your Son, Father, I pray that you grant them repentance and grant them faith, Lord, to believe. And Father, those of us who have been saved, oh Lord, may this message, message this morning strengthen our heart. Strengthen our heart to not only 
hear you and see you, Lord, in creation each and every day. But strengthen us as we understand more clearly that the Scriptures are our spiritual sustenance. It is where we get our spiritual strength. So, Father, I pray that you would help us to have a steady diet upon your word. Father, we ask you to bless this time of response. I pray that this message would sink deep into our hearts and that you would uh, just give your clarity, Lord, to anything that I've left undone. We'll give you all the praise and glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. What number? 491. 491. Let's all stand as we have a time of response. If you would like to come and pray, you may certainly do that. If you'd like for me to pray with you, I'll be down front and ready to pray with you if the Lord leads you. Out of my bondage, sorrow and night, Jesus, I come. Praise the Lord. Thank you for being here this morning. I want to invite you to come back tonight at 5 o'clock for our evening worship service. Is there choir practice? No choir practice this afternoon, so be here at 5 o'clock for our evening worship. If you're visiting with us, we're so glad that you are here, and we pray that you come back very, very soon. Is there any final word before we're dismissed and a word of prayer? Just please continue to pray for Elijah Talley. And uh, we've been praying for him for several years and uh, we certainly don't want to stop now. Pray for his, his family as they go through this very difficult time. All right, let's be dismissed in a word of prayer. Chris Phillips, would you please dismiss us in a word of prayer?